Let's go to Luke chapter uh, 24 once again, Luke chapter 24, just to get us going for this morning's topic in uh, our service. But uh, we are now noting the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And uh, the first major section within that that goes through verse 49 talks about the day of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, the events that occurred around His resurrection. And uh, it's kind of interesting that it doesn't really talk about the resurrection itself per se, but all the events that went on around the resurrection and then after the resurrection. And so what we've been doing over the last uh, couple of days and uh, finishing up today is actually talking about the resurrection itself where Jesus Christ was raised back to eternal glory. And so that's what we've been noting. And in verses 1 through 3, we see the first narrative of the women coming to the tomb and finding it empty. Therefore, we know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead because he was no longer laying in the tomb. So it says in verse 24, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So therefore, they recognized the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His body was not there. And then after the interactions with the angels that also were there, one of them rolling the stone away, others then sitting in the tomb as well and then speaking to the women, and then also later on uh, or shortly thereafter speaking with Jesus Christ himself, the women knew that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And so on Thursday, what we talked about was the trichotomous resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As he had that trichotomous separation upon his death on the cross, where his human spirit went to heaven to be with the Father, his soul went down into Hades inside the uh, ground or inside planet Earth, where believers and unbelievers were held uh, prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now only unbelievers reside in Hades, and that's where they go uh, when they die uh, in our current age and day, and therefore uh, uh, Jesus Christ went down to that place, proclaimed victory, uh, and that was won upon the cross, and his body remained in the tomb. So that was the trichotomous separation of body, spirit, and his soul. Well, upon his resurrection, God the Father brought that human spirit back into the body of Jesus Christ. And the Father is said to be the agent of Jesus Christ's resurrection on those scriptures on the board and as we noted on Thursday. God the Holy Spirit is also noted to be the agent of resurrection in regard to him taking that soul back from Hades and then uh, reuniting it with the body that laid in the tomb. And we see that in those verses as we studied on Thursday as well. Then we also recognize that Jesus Christ was the agent of his own resurrection in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, where he says, I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. And therefore, Jesus Christ uh, raised the body that was laying in the tomb, now reunited with spirit and soul, and then came forth from the tomb before we believe the rock was rolled away, opening up the tomb. And that resurrection body that Jesus Christ now resides in is sitting at the right hand of God the Father in eternal glory. That resurrection body was also the one that presented itself to the women and then to the disciples later on that very day. And that body was able to walk through walls and ultimately appear and disappear at will. And so therefore we recognize whether the stone was rolled away or not, it really doesn't matter, but the body ultimately could have walked right through that stone, even though it was not rolled away. But the stone was rolled away by the angels, and that was a dramatic scene, as we also noted in the other scriptures, again with the great earthquake, a great loud sound, and the brilliant light of that angel descending from heaven to roll that stone away. But the really intent of the stone being rolled away is so people could go in and view the empty tomb and know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. 
And so that's what we uh, focused on on Thursday night. Now what we're recognizing also is other important aspects of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting when we note the book of Acts and that first great evangelistic message that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost to his fellow Jews who had come in from all over the world to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, which again is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the Feast of First Fruits. It's funny how the book of Acts never talks about an empty tomb. It does talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it never tries to prove the point that the tomb of Jesus was empty. And that's very important. You see, that wasn't a fact that needed to be proved. You see, no one was questioning or refuting at that time that the tomb was empty. They all basically knew and they all understood that for one reason or another, the tomb of Jesus Christ was now vacant. No one was residing in that tomb. And it was well known throughout Jerusalem and now throughout Judea as well as all these other people are coming in from around uh, the entire world to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Many of them might have been there during the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, and then were there and understood the witnesses, seeing the other people come forth from their graves, recognizing the truth and the lie that was portrayed in regard to the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the fact of the matter is, no one was questioning the empty tomb at this point in time because it was not an issue and it couldn't be denied. And that's why, again, we saw the Pharisees coming up with a, a horrific lie to come up with an explanation as to why the tomb was empty. But we'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, if you like, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 2, because this is one verse that we have, but we're going to note a couple others. So, again, you go through the book of John, and then the first book after the Gospels is the book of Acts. <coughs> and in chapter 2, we see d uh, p uh, Peter giving his great discourse of evangelism on the Feast of Pentecost right after he received the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, along with the other disciples at that point in time, and then came out and was able to witness and evangelize to the people that were in Jerusalem at that time. And one of the things that he said, going back to chapter 2 and verse 31 as well, it says, and he, talking about David, David is in view, and he's talking about the psalm that David had wrote. In Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, it says, David, looking ahead, spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned in Hades, nor did his flesh see decay. And so this is one of the verses we noted on Thursday in regard to the resurrection and his soul coming back from Hades after it proclaimed victory to the uh, fallen angels who are held down in another compartment uh, below Hades and then also to the unbelievers who remain in that place. But ultimately he was not bound to Hades as a dead individual. You see, prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all dead people went down into Hades, whether they were believers or unbelievers. Now, when we think of Hades today, we think of hell, okay? But at that point in time, as you, uh, uh, I'm sure, fully are well aware of, it had two compartments. One was called Abraham's bosom, the place of paradise. The other was called the place of torments. Believers went to Abraham's bosoms, uh, bosom. Unbelievers went to the place of torments. And ultimately, every member of the human race resided down in that place inside of planet Earth. But upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he took the believers home, and ultimately now they're in heaven face to face with God. And that's what happens to believers now as they pass here on planet Earth. But the unbelievers still go down into Hades. But in any case, Jesus' body, or his soul ultimately, went down into Hades as the body remained in the tomb. His soul went down, but it was not abandoned there. It was raised up from that place. And no one else had been raised from Hades at this point in time. But Jesus Christ was, and because of his raising from the place called Hades, Abraham's bosom, ultimately uh, uh, believers now could receive that type of resurrection as well. So in any case, it also says, nor did his flesh 
undergo or see decay. So basically, his flesh did not rot in that tomb after the three days. It was not time to do that, okay? But ultimately, because of his resurrection, his body was brought back to life, and ultimately his flesh was changed into the resurrection form where he had flesh and bone, no blood, but flesh and bone, and ultimately now having a new resurrection body. So basically, when he's talking about looking ahead, spoke of the resurrection, he's not talking about an empty tomb. He's talking about the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is why the tomb is empty. But again, everybody knew that the tomb was empty. And that begged the question then, how did that tomb become empty? And then what, or was it an act of human power or divine power? And as we've already noted and already studied, we're not going to go into a lot of detail there, but remember the Pharisees. They were concerned about the resurrection of Jesus. So they went to Pilate. They asked him to secure the tomb, to put a seal on it. P Pilate gave them a guard, allowed them to seal it up, and they did so. So no one could come in and steal the body, and so the body could not walk out of that tomb as well. So the Pharisees took care of that aspect of it. But then when the body was removed through resurrection and the stone was rolled away and the guards came in and told them about it, they ultimately paid them off to lie about it and say, oh, tell them that you were overpowered by his disciples and ultimately they stole the body away. And that was the great lie, the great falsehood that was put out, the great conspiracy that was put out in that day. And many people believed it. And as the writers of the uh, Gospels said, who wrote many years later, said that that lie still exists today. Some people were believing that. So again, how did the tomb become empty? Was it an act of God and his power or an act of human power? And when we really think about it, there's only one answer as we recognize. And first and foremost, we know that the enemies of Jesus Christ would not come and take the body away because that would not suit their purposes or further their uh, 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 thoughts and opinions or their authority one bit. You see, Christ being resurrected would ultimately prove the points of what Jesus Christ was saying. Destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. After three days of being, uh, after, uh, being persecuted, the body will be in a tomb for three days and three nights. Jesus said, I will raise on the third day, or rise on the third day. So the enemies of Jesus had no motive in removing that because they were concerned about his preaching and teaching coming to fruition and him being truthful in what he said, and then they'd have to go along with that. What we also recognize is, no, the disciples did not overpower the guard and then break the Roman seal and ultimately remove the stone. We recognize that that would not happen. You see, these disciples had no power. They had no authority. And with the Roman seal and just seeing their, their Messiah be crucified and how they all ran, how afraid were they at this point in time that they too could come under persecution if they were to break a Roman seal, which was a big no-no back in the day, okay, and ultimately stole the body of Jesus away. How fearful they were for their own lives. So they too were not going to come and steal it away. They too would not have the ability to overpower the guards. So again, that human power, his friends could not ultimately do it, even though that was the lie that the Pharisees put out into the society. So therefore, there's really only one explanation for the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and really the tomb being empty. And the only explanation that uh, can have any fact or any truth to it is that God raised the body. And that's what we noted on Thursday, and as I just reviewed for you quickly again, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all three members of the Trinity had a hand in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And therefore, God was the one who removed the body and God was the one who vacated the tomb. Therefore, leaving it empty after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we think of it logically by itself, the enemies would not want to because, again, that would not further their cause. And it would, uh, again, support the words of Jesus, which they did not want supported. His friends had no power, nor did they have any courage at this point in time to go and do that. After they received the Holy Spirit, yeah, they had lots of courage at that point. 
But at this point, they had no courage whatsoever. They too would not have the power to raise or steal the body of Jesus. Only God could do it, and only God did do it, and that is why the tomb is empty. And so therefore, when Peter is now out there witnessing and evangelizing on that day of Pentecost, that's why he's bringing up the prophecy of David and now saying this has been fulfilled and we've all seen it. That is why the tomb is empty. And again, the reason, the power of God, the divine power of God. And as we're going to see as we go through and again towards the end of the lesson this morning, ultimately we see that that divine power is now available to you and I on a daily basis and for our resurrection that we too will receive one day. So again, divine power is the absolute uh, reason why the tomb was empty, not because of any human power or resources or assets that came to be. And that's why we also read, in, uh, as Paul stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it says, For indeed, he was crucified because of weakness. And again, not his own weakness, okay? We could say his human frailty, that he was allowed to be crucified. But again, the real intent there, or the uh, double meaning, is basically because of sin, okay? For he indeed was crucified because of weakness or because of our sin, yet he lives because of the power of of God, not because of human power or the body being stolen away by any member of the human race, but by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. So again, as Jesus Christ was the first fruits of resurrection, now we all will receive or everyone who believes in him will receive resurrection to eternal glory by the power of God. And so that the only question then worth asking or arguing is to why the tomb was empty. Again, the how has already been solved only by God. But why? Why did God raise him to eternal glory? And so with what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at seven different reasons why Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And again, comparing Scripture with Scripture, understanding what the Word of God has to say, why was Jesus Christ raised from the dead? Well, the first answer to all of that is because of who and what He is. He is God, okay? And He is God incarnate. Yes, He had 100% humanity, but at the same time, He is deity. So again, because of who and what He is as the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer, and as God Himself. And so Acts chapter 2, verse 24, gives us a little bit more about this. So let's go back into Acts chapter 2 and then look at verse 24. It says, And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Again, it's impossible for him to be held. Well, every member of the human race, it's very possible for us to be held by sin and by death. Very possible. And that's why people are residing in Hades today, and that's why they and the fallen angelic race will be cast into the eternal lake of fire, because they will be held in death because of sin forevermore. But for Jesus, it's impossible for him. Why? Because of the deity that went along with his humanity. Because he's God. And God cannot be held by death. God cannot be held by sin. And the humanity of Jesus Christ for a time was. But again, because he won the victory in his humanity over sin and death, now his deity is shining forward and it is impossible for him to be held because or or by sin or by death. And again, that's why the tomb is empty. And then we also see to fulfill Scripture, as it then says in the next few verses. And so let's read. And this is, again, part of Peter's great evangelistic message in chapter 2, verse 25 through 31. It says, For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope 
because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of truth. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Therefore, excuse me, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, and that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. So again, to fulfill prophecy, as David spoke hundreds of years ago about one of his descendants, and uh, knowing that his Lord would be his Lord, his Savior, and Messiah, ultimately, Jesus Christ was raised to fulfill prophecy, the Word of God, as we can also compare in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, and also seeing in Jeremiah uh, chapter 33 and Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 32. Let's also turn, because we're going to be in the book of Romans now for the next couple of points. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And look at verse 4 specifically. And Paul, again, uh, giving the opening to uh, his uh, epistle of Romans. And again, go back to verse 1. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So again, we see the prophecy there as well. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of Holiness. And that should be a capital S for the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So again, because of prophecy, we see the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then another why is so that Jesus Christ could then become the bestower of life to the rest of the human race. And in the life that he now lives in resurrection form, he now can give us that life who believe upon him. And he is the bestower of that life. Let's flip to Romans chapter 7 and look at that in verse 4. <clears throat> All right, then in verse 4 it says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. And in verse 5 it says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Oldness of the law is what's in view. So because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, again, we now can receive that life. And Jesus Christ is the one who gives us that life. And as he won the victory over sin and death, now he can give us that victory so that we have eternal life and we are no longer held by sin, nor will we be held by death. And then the other aspect of why Jesus Christ was resurrected is so that he could give us power. And we're going to see that. And at the end, we're going to come back and look at first, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 and other verses as well that go with the other points. But at the same time, we see the power of God. And let's look at Romans chapter 6, since we're there, in verse 4, so that we can have that power and live in that power and then enjoy that resurrection power for all of eternity. So Romans 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk 
in newness of life. And again, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that's going to give us a resurrection body in the eternal state. But as this verse says, the power to live every day, the newness of life, to walk in that unique spiritual life that God has given to you, the Christian way of life, in order to have the indwelling of all three members of the Trinity, including the power of God the Holy Spirit who works through us so that we can learn and apply these things each and every day. God has given us this power. Jesus Christ has given us this power. And again, as demonstrated through his resurrection. And we ask ourselves the question, if God could raise that dead body back to life, can he help us in our daily problems each and every day? Absolutely. If God is going to resurrect us back to eternal life and give us that life, can he help us through our daily walk as we now go forward each and every day? And the answer to that is, again, rhetorical question is, absolutely. If God can raise the dead, he can help you to overcome the problems that we are facing each and every day. But the fact is, we have to turn to him in faith and trust in him and rely upon him and call for him and ask him to impart that power through the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome and endure all things, whatever we may be facing. And whether it be bad or be good, because sometimes the good can lead you astray away from your relationship with God. So again, even in the good, Continue to rely upon the power to enjoy that good, but not be overwhelmed by that good. So then also Jesus Christ was resurrected to be the head over all things, including the church. Again, he, we are the body. He is the head. And ultimately, he will be that for all of eternity. Not only do we see the analogy of the bride and the bride, uh, or, or the bridegroom and the bride, but in, as we recognize as the authority and head, uh, as the husband is the head over the wife, and as he will be our husband and we will be his wife for all of eternity. In that same analogy, we see him as the head or the authority over the church, which we are now part of that body. Again, we're going to come back and see some scriptures on that in the book of Ephesians in just a minute. Then the sixth of the seven that we have is that so he could be an emblem of our justification. And this is an important aspect that we have been justified. Even though we continue to sin after our salvation and all the sins we committed prior to our salvation, Jesus Christ paid for those sins upon the cross. And because we have now believed upon him, we have forgiveness of those sins. And those sins no longer condemn us to the eternal lake of fire. Because we have been what? Justified. Not because of the good works that we do. Again, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works. It's a gift of God so that no one may boast. Again, it's a gift of God that we have been justified. Not by works, lest any man should boast. And so we have been justified even though we still are wicked, rotten, wretched sinners. But in the eyes of God... We stand holy and righteous and clean. Our sins washed away. Our sins forgiven for all of eternity. And we stand before God justified. And even as Satan is up in heaven accusing us day in and day out, night and day it says, he accuses us before God and says, look at that sinner down there, how rotten and wretched they are. Why do they get to go to heaven? Why do they get, get to be uh, go free? And Jesus Christ just turns to them and basically says, because they're justified. They're justified because of what I accomplished on the cross and their non-meritorious act of faith in what I did for them. They are justified. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrates that justification. Because again, if we weren't justified, if we weren't made holy and righteous and washed clean of our sins, then death would still have a hold over us because sin would still have a hold over us. But because sin no longer has a hold because our sins have been paid for and we have been justified, now we can live a new life unto Christ. And now we can be made holy and righteous and we are washed clean. We are justified in the eyes of God. 
and we stand before God in that realm each and every day. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 4 and look at verse 25. And in verse 25 it says, He who was delivered up because of our transgressions, that's Jesus Christ going to the cross to pay for our sins, and was raised, again on the third day as we're noting, why? Because of our justification. You see, he was raised so that we could be justified. And Jesus Christ is that great emblem of our justification. He is that great you know, uh, marker, that monarchy, that great jumbotron in the sky that says, you're justified, you're justified, you're justified, because he has now been justified. He has been resurrected to eternal glory. He has now demonstrated that sin and death no longer have a hold on anyone. So again, he's the great emblem of our justification. And because of his resurrection, we receive that justification. We stand holy, righteous, and clean before God each day and every day. And that's how you need to think of yourself and how your daily walk and not condemn yourself. Again, yeah, you can feel bad or sorry about your sins, and you should, okay? But you don't beat yourself up. And you don't get in this total depressive state of, I'm not worthy, I'm a sinner, I'm wicked, I'm rotten, I'm wretched. Because if you go down that rat hole, what does that mean? You're not trusting in God. You're not believing that He died for your sins, He paid for your sins. Now, we also don't use it as an excuse to sin and just kind of wipe our sins away that I can sin, but then I'll wipe it away. I'll sin again. I'll wipe it away. I'll sin again. Wipe it away. I mean, technically, you probably could do that, okay? But technically, you should not do that, okay? Because that's not living the Christian way of life, okay? So again, we don't get the ultra-depressive state and we don't get the, uh, the, uh, the ultra uh the phrase I'm looking for, uh, ju- uh, well, I hate to say justification, but you know, self-justification for sinning each and every day and committing sin over and over and over again and using it as an excuse to sin because I can just confess it and then I'm fine. Okay, Again, that's no way to live. So again, Jesus Christ justified us and we stand justified before him each and every day. And then the final aspect of why Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, as we've uh, studied and noted in 1 Corinthians already in chapter 15, the great chapter on resurrection, to be the first fruits of all who have been raised. And again, that is why those believers resided in Abraham's bosom down there in paradise, in Hades, that compartment that's no longer there. That's why they resided down there. Because, again, nothing, could, uh, nothing happened to overcome their sin yet. And so they resided in that place. But when Jesus Christ came and paid for our sins and then was the first fruits of those resurrected, now everyone else could follow. Everyone else who would believe upon him, whether it be uh, back in the ancient days prior to his crucifixion and resurrection, those who were looking forward to the Messiah, those who knew what the Messiah would accomplish for them, what God would do for their sin and justify them, they now could be raised to eternal glory. And they were, and they were brought up into heaven and now residing in their interim resurrection bodies, waiting to receive their final resurrection body. They're in heaven now with God because Jesus Christ was the first fruits of all who have been raised. And now, what we note, again, another doctrine for another day, is the other resurrections to eternal glory that are going to happen. And the first group or generation that is going to receive that is the church age that we have been living in since the day of Pentecost, right up to our day and age. And maybe, again, next week is uh, the Feast of um, uh, Rosh Hashanah, okay? Maybe that will be the time of our resurrection and the rapture of the church and the church age will be over. But if it's not this weekend, then they'll see you for another year, people, as you know, I like to say, all right? But in any case, at least another year, all right? But in any case, uh, because of Jesus' resurrection, now the church will be raised to eternal glory at the end of our age. And then the Old Testament saints at the end of the tribulation, then the millennial saints at the end of the millennial reign. So again, each in its own order. But Jesus Christ, the firstfruits of all who have been raised. 
In Acts chapter 2, let's just turn back just a page or two to Acts chapter uh, 26 in verse 23. Again, you're in Romans, just go back a page or two. Acts 26. <coughs> In Acts chapter 26 and verse 23. And again, just to, uh, yep, I'm in the right place, just go back to 22 to give us a little uh, context. It says, And so, having obtained help from God, it says, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. So again, to fulfill prophecy. Verse 23, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And Jesus Christ upon his resurrection was that. And as we said, he, he witnessed to the women at the garden. He witnessed to Peter. He also witnessed to the soldiers who, de who saw and witnessed the resurrection, uh, the Gentiles, and then uh, ultimately uh, to all the disciples. And then he went up into Galilee. And he continued to preach and teach up there for 40 days to both Jews and Gentiles. So then it says in verse 24, And while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind, okay? But you guys have gotten that a lot of times when you teach and preach the gospel. You're out of your mind. Are you kidding me? All right. It says, uh, again, uh, you're out of, it says, your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. Again, all these things, the resurrection of Christ has not been hidden away. Then in verse 27, it says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And we can almost add two, okay? You will persuade me to become a Christian. Then in verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God, I would to God, that whether in short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. So again, Jesus Christ was raised to be the first fruits of all who would be resurrected. And as it says in this passage, again, the first to proclaim his resurrection and life to both the Jew and the Gentile. And as Paul is now there on trial before King Agrippa, again, the king of Israel, or the puppet king of Israel at that point in time, and Festus, the governor of the local area, he is now also witnessing to them. And they're being persuaded, but yet, Paul, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. Okay? But what was Paul's great wish? That everyone would come to know these words. What should be our great wish? That everyone should come to know these words. That everyone should come to salvation and know the person of Jesus Christ so that they too can be resurrected to eternal glory and be with God one day forever and ever and ever. All right, so that gives us the seven reasons, but then we recognize that the resurrection is victory over sin and death. That's what it's all about, victory over sin and death. Sin and death that came into the world when Satan deceived the woman and ultimately uh, you know, convinced Adam to follow his lead, to actually rebel against God. And because of that original sin, sin entered into the human race and death along with it. But Jesus Christ won the victory over sin and death by paying for every sin and then giving his life, both spiritually and then physically. But now being raised to eternal glory shows that sin and death no longer has a hold. And Jesus Christ has won the great victory. We call it the strategic victory of the angelic conflict. He won the victory over sin and death. And the power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead 
is now made available to you and I so that we can live the Christian way of life here on planet Earth, and one day we too will be raised to eternal glory. So now let's go to the book of Ephesians because there's a number of verses that go with the points that I mentioned plus this point, and again in greater context, that give us all this information and give us this great encouragement as to how we should be living our lives each and every day. So again, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, then you get the book of Ephesians, and then in chapter 1, and we're going to note uh, verse 18 down to verse uh, 23. And here's Paul, again, speaking to the church at Ephesus. It says, I, and, and, and really a message that God has given to all of us, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. And again, we've uh, studied this out in the Greek before, and there's actually three different Greek words that talk about different types of power and strength and ability. And again, this is what Paul's saying, I desire you to have this because it's available to you. As God is this power in these three different aspects, this power is yours as well to be living in and walking in each and every day. But you can only live and walk in it when you know about that power and that power being available to you. And how do you know that power? Through the Word of God. With what we're studying this morning, the power of the resurrection of Christ, the promise of our resurrection, the promise of our eternal glory, and also the uh, understanding that the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that's available to us right now in our daily walk. And as Paul says, I want you to know this according with the working of the strength of his might. Verse 19. Now verse 20. Which he brought about in him, or in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now in verse 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And I kind of get excited. I get goosebumps when I read that. The one to come, okay? What's that age to come? That's after human history is done and we're living in eternity, okay? And whatever is going to happen then. And remember, our God's a creator. You don't think there's going to be continued creation after the human race is done and now we're just up in in, in heaven with God? No, there's going to be so many more things that are going to happen for all of eternity. All right? So, and again, and, and, and in all those things, guess what? Jesus is going to be praised. So, again, another exciting aspect. But the power of God to do these things and the dominion and authority that have been given to Jesus is available to us. Now in verse 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And again, if he's the head and we are the body, as we noted in the other aspects of why Jesus Christ was resurrected, the imparting of this power to be the head over the church, okay? Again, you know, does your head do different things than your body? No, they work in conjunction, okay? They work together. And your head and your body go hand in hand. And if your head and body are separated, guess what? There's no life in either one of them. They both die, okay? But when they're joined, there is life and there is strength and there is power and there is mobility and there is ability. And so therefore, that is what this message is conveying. Jesus Christ is the head. We are the body. We are connected. We are attached. And we work as one. And the power that the head has is the power that the body has. And that power is available to you and I each and every day to give you strength and courage and encouragement, not to be wallowing in, in, uh, in, in sorrow and suffering and pain, not to be wallowing in depression, not to be seeking the frantic search of happiness by looking at the world to get this and to get that, thinking that's going to make you happy. No, the power of God is there, resident within your soul to overcome. 
and the power of God that was able to, as I said last week, allow Peter to walk on water is power that's available to us when we have strength. The power to move mountains that God, Jesus Christ, spoke of is power that's available to us. And again, there's no problem, no difficulty, no heartache, no sorrow, no obstacle that cannot be overcome in the mentality of your soul through the power of God in your soul. And the more we know of the Word of God, the more we know of the power of God and what's available to us. And the only thing that's really limiting us is us and our lack of faith and not trusting and not believing and not thinking this, that, or the other thing. No. When we trust in the Word of God and apply the Word of God, the power of God is available to us to overcome all things. And so therefore, there is nothing in this world we should be worried about. There is nothing we should be afraid of because the power of God is there for us in all things. And that's why Paul also said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. And again, when he talks about being conformed to his death, what's he saying? My sin has been overcome. You see, the death of Jesus Christ brought about the forgiveness of our sin, brought about the, the defeat of the power that had a hold on us prior to our salvation. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And again, the fellowship of his suffering and being conformed to his death. And think about, we just studied the whole death of Jesus Christ. We just studied the whole cross of Jesus Christ. What did he say while he was on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. Mother, your son. Son, your mother. You see, when he was on the cross suffering, he was thinking of other people. He was not thinking about his pain, his sorrow, and his suffering. He was thinking about, how can I witness? How can I evangelize? How can I get more people to realize the power that they have available to them? How can I get them to know? And at the end, it is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All of these things are given to us so that we too can recognize, regardless of the problems, of the difficulties, the suffering, even if it comes to martyrdom. Again, 